Hello and welcome to Lecture 5, which is on Aspects of Connected Speech. In this lecture, we'll be looking at speech rhythm, connected speech processes, which include assimilation, coalescence, elision and sandy R, and juncture, briefly, at the end. In the first part of this video, we'll be looking at speech rhythm. In the second part, we'll be looking at the other processes. So we're going to start now by considering speech rhythm. Rhythm is some noticeable event that occurs at regular intervals, such as a heartbeat, a flashing light, or music. It's claimed that English speech is rhythmical, but it's not suggested that this is as regular as a clock ticking, which is very, very regular indeed. English speech rhythm is sometimes referred to as stress-timed. What this means is that the stressed syllables tend to occur at relatively regular intervals. And this happens whether they're separated by other syllables or not. So if we look at our sentence at the bottom of this um, slide here, we can see that we have five stressed syllables, walk, down, path, end, and now. And the idea is that it takes equal amounts of time to get from one stress to the next. So what this means is that it would take the same amount of time, roughly, to say the word walk as it would to say um, end of the cut. So that's the general principle here. So stress timing can be defined as the time from each stress syllable to the next will tend to be the same, irrespective of the number of intervening stress syllables. Some languages have a rhythm similar to English, for example, Russian and Arabic, and others have a different rhythm. So if you listen to French and Yoruba or Japanese or Chinese, for example, they have a very different kind of speech rhythm. And this rhythm is known as syllable timed. And what this means is that all syllables tend to occur at regular time intervals rather than all stresses tending to occur at regular time um, intervals. So if we go back to our sentence, we can actually consider it in terms of the foot and how long it takes to say the foot. The foot is a unit of rhythm that's often used in poetry. So if we have our um, utterance here, walk down the path to the end of the canal, and we divide it into feet um, using these lines here, we can see that the foot begins with a stress and it includes everything up to, but not including, the next stressed syllable. So we've got our foot here, which is walk. And then the next foot is down the. The next foot is path to the. The next foot is end of the c. And the last foot is now. And so the idea would be that it, um, it, it rhythmically, each one of these feet is roughly the same length. Now we can do this using um, a click like this walk down the path to the end of the canal. So if I'm saying the sentence very rhythmically, and I don't think that sounds unnatural, walk down the path to the end of the canal, it sounds fairly natural. So what we have to do in order to achieve this rhythm is squash syllables in, if there are large numbers of them, into the rhythm. So when I say walk, it takes quite a long time to say that, but by the time I get to end of the cut, I'm saying that rather quickly. Now, not all varieties of English have the same kind of speech rhythm. Um, the variety that we're looking at here, which we're calling the reference accent, which is RP, BBC English, General British, whatever we're calling it, um, has this kind of rhythm, or is supposed to have this kind of rhythm. However, um, other varieties of English don't necessarily have this kind of rhythm, and I'm going to show you an example of a Nigerian English speaker who has a different um, has a different kind of rhythm of English. In fact, his rhythm is more syllable timed, which means when he speaks English, his syllables are more similar in length. Um, now, this is actually embedded in my blog post where I'm discussing schwa and what schwa is. Schwa is a vowel found in weak syllables, um, and he's actually here, and he's going to tell us about a poem. And just listen to the way he says the phrase, the passion of the poem. That's what I want you to listen to. And you'll notice that it's quite different from my utterance, the passion of the poem, the way that he says it. 
Hello everybody, um, this is your boy Dami. I'm back with another one of my very special videos. Um, but the only thing now is this one is not a comedy show. It's actually just a poem that I wrote by myself. So it's an original poem. And also I decided to do it in my Nigerian accent so that you guys can feel the passion. Passion. Say passion. Say it with me. Say it with me. Passion. Exactly. The passion of the poem. So... Um, Okay, now you can see the rest of this video if you want to on my blog post, um, which is a world of .blogspot.co.uk. And also, I've given a transcription of the way that he's saying this. So I say the passion of the poem, but he says the passion of the poem. That's how he actually says that, which is quite different. So his speech rhythm is different from the kind of reference accent we're looking at in this course. Now we can use tree diagrams to indicate strong and weak syllables in English and by using tree diagrams we can build up a representation of which syllables are strong so we can look at the stress pattern. Some feet are stronger than others so we're going to look at strong weak patterns produced in larger pieces of speech. To start with we've got the word 20. In the word 20 we have a stressed syllable which is this one here so that's the strongest syllable and we've got um, an unstressed syllable which is weak so twin is produced strongly and t is a weak syllable and we talked about strong and weak syllables in week four if i have this in a phrase so now i've got 20 places 20 places um, we can see again that we've got strong syllable here and another one there and our other two syllables are weak um, also, we can see that we've got strong and weak indicated above as well. So the strong one is indicated over here and the weak one is indicated over there. Why is that? It's because if you have utterances of more than one word um, and you've got content words, then the, um, the strongest stress is on the stressed syllable of the last content word. And in that case, this is play. So this is where the strongest stress is and this is weaker. Now we can already see that we've got two S's over play and one S over twen. So here's our one S here, whereas in play we've now got two, um, two S's going on there. If I build this up into a larger phrase, um, we've now got 20 places further back, we can build an even bigger tree diagram. So we've still got our strong, weak, strong, weak, etc. Um, the last content word is now back and you can see here that we've got one, two, three strongs over, over this part of the tree. Um, so this is the strong part, this is the weak bit here. We've got the same thing going on here, we've got strong and weak and um, we've got um, a weak branch there and a strong one here. So back is clearly the most strong stress here. Um, it has three um, strongs over it indicating that. And we can use this to build up something called a metrical grid. So analyzing speech this way enables us to show the relationships between the strong and weak syllables and the different levels of stress. And if we look at a metrical grid, um, we can see that it's going to look something like this for the, um, for the, the utterance we were looking at 20 places further back. And that's assuming that this is produced um, with no prior context. Now it's possible, of course, to put stronger stresses on other um, syllables in this. So for example, if somebody said to me, did you say 10 syllables further back? Then I might say, no, I said 20 syllables. Sorry, syllables, what am I talking about? If somebody said, did you say 10 places further back? Then I would say, no, I said 20 places further back. So clearly, twen is the strongest stress there, and that would need to be indicated in the tree diagram and in the metrical grid. But what we do know is that English likes to have an alternation of strong and weak syllables. Um, and we find that this pattern is something that English tries very hard to preserve, at least the reference accent that we're looking at on this course. In order to preserve that, we sometimes get something called stress shift. So if we have um, words of more than one syllable where the stress is near the end, so for example, in the, in the adjective compact, the stress is on the second syllable. If we then have um, a noun following where the stress is at the start, then what we find is that the stress moves from this syllable away 
from that other stress, so it moves backwards. So we don't say compact disc, we say compact disc, and this is known as stress shift. Other examples include words ending in teen, so 13, but 13th place, 13th birthday, and also Heathrow, but Heathrow Airport. In fact, this little village, Heathrow, people don't know that's the stressing of it anymore. We're used to seeing it with the airport, so people tend to think it's stressed Heathrow, but actually it's Heathrow. So what is going on here is that the stresses are altered according to the context, and it's difficult to say exactly why, but it seems to be in order to maintain this pattern of strong, weak, strong, weak, strong, weak um, in English. And what we need to understand is that not all speech is very, very strongly rhythmical. We vary how we speak um, when we're doing different kinds of things. Rap, for example, is very, very strongly stress-timed, and this is certainly a skill. If you've seen any of the videos where people do rap-offs, um, then you know that they're doing this spontaneously, and being able to do this spontaneously is a real skill. Public speaking can be very rhythmical, usually because it's rehearsed over and over again, and people know that they want to make particular points, so they stress certain syllables, and this means that you tend to have a very rhythmic kind of speech. If we think about great speeches like Martin Luther King's I Have a Dream, for example, um, if you listen to that speech, you can really hear how rhythmical it is. If you're hesitant or nervous, then the speech doesn't sound particularly rhythmical at all. In fact, we say it's arrhythmical, without rhythm. So what we can say is the rhythm of English speech varies on a continuum between very, very stress-timed, if we're looking at things like rap, and arrhythmical. Now I'm going to show you um, a video of um, a rap off between um, Snow White and Elsa from Frozen um, so that you can hear some rap music. Um, this, is, this is quite funny, I think. There's lots of videos with the Disney princesses. Um, I'm sure you'll enjoy this one. Snow White versus Elsa. Let the rap battle begin! It's not lame that my aim here's to tell you the truth. I'll hit it out of the park like my name is Babe Ruth. Got a star on the Hollywood Walk of Fame. The fact that you can't claim the same is really a shame. I'm the original princess. You're a copy of a copy. I am porcelain and perfect and your floppy hair is sloppy. I'm fragile but agile. Rarely cross. I am sweet. You can tweet. I'm a treat like a boss. Who the hell are you to step to me? An aimless airhead with a vitamin D deficiency? You got no skills cause you're focused on your looks. And let's get to what was up with you and those seven schnooks. I hope. I've heard you sing, it's a high-pitched chirp. You dopey. You're grumpy. You're a bashful twerp. That squeaky meek demeanor is an awful choice. I can drown you out right now with my powerful voice. Okay, you get the idea. So, rap music, very, very strongly rhythmical. And if you see anyone doing this, um, spontaneously, it really is a skill that has to be learned. Now, one question is whether stress timing is real. There have been studies of natural speech which have shown that so-called stress time languages actually don't differ that much from so-called syllable time languages. In fact, Peter Roach, who wrote the textbook that we're following on this module, um, did some research on this. So, what's going on then? It may be a psychological thing. We hear stressed syllables and we impose a regular rhythm, which isn't actually regular. Also, we may do it because of things like nursery rhymes and chants, which are part of our culture. If you listen to different sorts of child-directed or um, child-like language, um, you often notice that um, it's very culture-specific. And so if you have a nursery rhyme in English, then it tends to be um, quite stress-timed. So one, two, buckle my shoe, three, four, knock at the door. These things are quite stress-timed and we're, we're squashing syllables in knock at the door to fit with the rhythm. So it's possible that it has something to do with childhood language. So in this lecture so far we've looked at speech rhythm and in the next part we're going to look at connected speech processes and for that you need to go on to the next video.